everyone. Welcome. My name is Claire Seafried, and today I'm going to talk with you about supporting augmentative and alternative communication in an early intensive behavior intervention classroom. So again, my name is Claire Seafried, and I'm a speech language pathologist at the Els for Autism Foundation here in Jupiter, Florida. And at the foundation, I work with individuals across the age span from early intervention into adulthood. And I spend a lot of time in our EIBI classroom where I create various AAC supports and implement a literacy-based augmentative and alternative communication program, which we'll talk more about shortly. So throughout this presentation, I hope listeners will gain a general understanding of alternative and augmentative communication, as well as be able to identify and use behavior analytic teaching practices to support the implementation of AAC within the classroom. And I hope listeners will learn how to include core vocabulary or high frequency words into language and literacy instruction. The collaborative roles of a behavior analyst and a speech language pathologist in treating individuals on the autism spectrum will also be discussed. And so I'll start by giving a brief overview of AAC. AAC describes multiple ways to communicate that can supplement or compensate for the impairment of individuals with severe communication disorders. And this is not just limited to autism. This is used with adults who have suffered a stroke or a traumatic brain injury and now have difficulty communicating. AAC can be used for individuals who are neurotypical but need visual supports to better understand material receptively. So AAC can be used across ages and abilities. It's augmentative when it's used to supplement speech, and it's alternative when used in place of speech. And here's a picture of varying types of AAC. So here you see an iPad that likely includes a speech generating communication app. You see someone pointing their finger. You see some kind of picture exchange communication system, or maybe this is a core communication board and the use of a Big Mac button. And we'll talk about the types of AAC on the next slide. So there are two types of AAC. You have your unaided systems and your aided systems. Your unaided systems are going to include gestures, body language, facial expressions, and sign. Whereas your aided systems are going to be split into two categories, your basic aided and your high aided, your high tech aided systems. And aided systems include the use of a tool or a device. So your basic aided systems are going to include pointing to letters, words, or pictures on a board, or the use of pen and paper. And your high-tech aided systems will include more of your speech generating devices, or maybe even an iPad with a speech generating communication app. And so here is what the literature of research tells us about AAC. AAC helps improve natural speech. It helps decrease the frequency of challenging behaviors that may arise from frustration or communication breakdowns. And when implemented early, AAC may support the development of natural speech and language. AAC can also lend to increases in receptive vocabulary in children. It helps develop functional communication skills. AAC promotes cognitive development and it provides a foundation for literacy development and it even improves social communication. So if it's not already obvious why we use AAC, here is more information to support its use. In addition to everything I just stated about the AAC research, AAC can be used to teach functional communication. Here you see a picture of myself and a young man who's learning to use a high-tech AAC system. Particularly, this man is using an iPad with the speech generating app, Speak for Yourself. And while this presentation focuses on intervention in the preschool classroom, this demonstrates a man using an AAC system in order to be successful at his job. And with AAC supports, this man uses fewer perseverative one word utterances and can use phrases to request, comment, and ask for assistance. AAC may also provide more opportunities for independent participation and it can improve an individual's understanding of others' communication. 
and it can also benefit verbal learners with literacy, social and emotional competencies, and expressive language. So now we will discuss the literacy-based intervention that utilizes AAC supports that we use in our EIBI classroom. The curriculum is called Tell Me AAC, and it was developed by Dr. Carol Zingari and Lori Wise. And we'll now discuss the purpose and the focus of this curriculum alongside strategies and techniques utilized. So the purpose of Tell Me AAC is to provide opportunities to teach and practice the vocabulary that's needed to expand language. An expanded language can lead to access to reinforcement from a behavior analytics standpoint, which can lead to a decrease in maladaptive behaviors. And the focus of this intervention is on repeated readings of carefully chosen storybooks. And these stories are going to contain core words, which we'll talk more about shortly. And these core vocabulary words can be generalized across environments. And the collaboration between disciplines of a speech language pathologist and a behavior therapist is important to ensure that the client is exposed to words that are not only functional, but are meaningful. And again, we're using AAC supports to build language skills. This includes visual supports, maybe the use of a speech generating device, a core communication board, etc. And so now we'll discuss core vocabulary. So what is core vocabulary? Core vocabulary makes up approximately approximately 80% of our vocabulary. It includes words like I, see, you, my, want, do, it, she, he, yes, no, the, is. It's about those 500 or so words that are used most frequently throughout the day. And by mastering these words, children can say many things. And here's a great quote. It says, core words are the glue that make our language cohesive and give us many opportunities to learn and practice language. And so while core words make up approximately 80% of our vocabulary, we also have fringe words or fringe vocabulary that make up the remaining approximately 20% of our language. And while core vocabulary includes verbs, adjectives, prepositions, pronouns, articles, and conjunctions, fringe vocabulary includes nouns and more specific verbs and adjectives. It includes words that are personal to the individual. So your sibling's name, your favorite place, thing, etc. <clears throat> and here's a great citation stating that it's best clinical practice to not include vocabulary based on the categorization of words that are core or fringe, but rather to strike a balance between the two to best reflect language development and vocabulary acquisition. It's important to note that while yes, core words make up 80% of our vocabulary, but fringe vocabulary, the other 20%, are also critical when it comes to effectively communicating. And when selecting intervention targets, we want the behaviors of the learner to guide the decision of what we are targeting. Targets can be chosen via direct assessment, indirect assessment, and functional communication training. And direct assessments may include functional behavior assessments to identify a specific target behavior and their purpose, a direct observation, and it may also include a standardized language assessment that may be administered by a speech language pathologist. And this may include a test like the PLS-5 or the CELF-5, and of course there's a variety of other test batteries that can be used as well. Curriculum-based assessments may also be used. This may include the VBMAP, PEAK, or ACE, and indirect assessments may include your parent caregiver interviews, questionnaires, and then there's also functional communication training that can help decide the target words or intervention targets. And so we select these targets based on the client's function of behavior and motivation. And additionally, we want the intervention targets to provide access to social engagement and positive experiences. We want this to be fun and motivating and exciting for the client. We do not want to limit a child's ability to engage in a communicative interaction as that will negatively affect a child's pragmatic development. And when choosing intervention targets, 
We want the targets to lend across multiple contexts. Children demonstrate better learning and generalization of core vocabulary when used across environments and activities. We can do this by embedding core vocabulary through interactive, predictable book readings. And the goal is to increase a child's vocabulary to enable them to be an effective and efficient communicator. And children with language impairments who use AAC will likely require additional exposures to learn a word. And this is why it's essential to incorporate repeated practice of the selected intervention target. It's also important to use evidence-based teaching practices and to use these repeated practices across meaningful, purposeful activities. It's also essential in prompting language, literacy, and communication development. All right, so now we'll discuss using AAC in the context of story time. And so again, this intervention is based off the Tell Me AAC curriculum in the preschool classroom, which was developed by Carol Zingari and Lori Wise. And it was developed by these two speech language pathologists to support literacy and language learning for AAC users. And so first we choose a story and we'll choose the core vocabulary words or our language targets for the said lesson. And we want stories that are repetitive in nature and include core vocabulary with opportunities for lots and lots and lots of practice. We also wanna make sure these stories are developmentally appropriate to the clients we are serving. <clears throat> Excuse me. So for example, brown bear, brown bear. This story has many, many repetitive words throughout the story. So as the story goes, brown bear, brown bear, what do you see? I see a red bird looking at me. So perhaps the word see, S-E-E, -E, is one of our targeted vocabulary words that we choose for this story. As this word will appear many times throughout the story, giving us many opportunities to use the word for practice throughout the intervention. And so after the story is chosen, you'll select anywhere from four to 10 vocabulary words. And again, we want these words to provide opportunities for practice, like the word see throughout the story, brown bear, brown bear. And we want them to be repeated frequently throughout the story. And we want these words to serve a communicative purpose. So we don't just wanna choose a word that won't allow for generalization or the opportunity to be used across multiple contexts. We wanna ensure the words are chosen and are relevant and important for social communication and emergent literacy. So next, you will pre prepare for the actual story time. This includes creating laminated cards of the target words. So as shown here, you can see six vocabulary words that were used for, this partic for whatever particular story. <clears throat> And you want to include the core vocabulary word as well as the symbol. And to the right, there are two posters. You'll see a what happened poster and a who poster. And these posters are used for after the story, which we'll discuss shortly. And you may choose to copy and laminate pictures from the story to be incorporated with these supports to work on identifying who was in the story and what, what happened. And when discussing what happened in the story, you may include temporal sequencing of what happened. So first, we saw this, then this happened, and last, X, Y, Z. So when preparing for the story time, there are a few things you wanna make sure you consider. How long will you have to run the story time? Are there particular extension activities that may work well for the targeted words chosen for the particular book? Are these activities that could create opportunities for generalizing? The number of partici participants in the session is another factor you, wanna you want to consider. Perhaps you decide to create client-specific goals during the story time. So for example, student A will repeat the vocabulary word on their AAC device. And maybe student B's goal is to provide a verbal approximation of the said vocabulary word. Whereas student C may be working on more advanced literacy skills like sequencing or story mapping. And now we begin with the teaching protocol for the story. So first we introduce the core vocabulary word and we do this by pointing to each visual support of the word. So here we are priming or pre-teaching the vocabulary. 
We may even use a pointing gesture to the picture card, or we may model on a speech generating device to each vocabulary card and say the word aloud. And it may be advantageous for AAC learners to see the word modeled on a model device by the clinician. The goal is for the learner to respond to the immediate prompt. And it should be noted that responses will vary depending on the learner's current repertoire. And then we want to provide reinforcement for correct responding, and we want to provide reinforcement for stated responses throughout the actual story and thereafter. And so here's just a picture of some of the core vocabulary cards. So again, you'll see you have the core word, and then you have a picture to represent the core vocabulary word. And here are some visual supports that are utilized throughout one of the story readings. And this is something that can be used on the story map for what happened or who was in the book or whatever the picture support pertains to. When introducing the story, the clinician should introduce the book to the learners by discussing emergency, emergent literacy concepts. So this includes pointing to the title of the book and saying, you know, our book is called Pete the Cat, or our book is called Brown Bear, Brown Bear, What Do You See? You'll also want to say who the book is written and illustrated by. And when introducing the illustrator, you may choose to say what an illustrator is. Not all of our students are going to have be able to identify what an illustrator is yet. So you may say, you know, an illustrator is, an illustrator is someone who draws pictures. An illustrator for this book is whoever it is. And you may bring awareness when turning the pages by stating, you know, now I'll turn the page or allow the student to say it. Now it's time to, and then you wait, and the student can then say turn or turn the page. And you don't just want to read the book without drawing attention to some of the illustrations. You know, point to some of the pictures throughout the story and say, look, I see a dog. Or say, look, how do you think this character feels? Or look, this character is doing this. When reading the story, when the target words are read, the clinician will point to the target word. During the first story lesson, the clinician will not require the learner resp to respond as we are familiarizing learners with the words. Following subsequent readings, the clinician will point to the targeted core word as it's being read and follow a most to least prompting procedure to promote independent responding based off the learner's individual goals. So maybe you start with a verbal model and then fade to a gestural cue. These story times can of course be enriched by having students act out activities, tact items, identify emotions, actions, and more. We want to make these stories fun and motivating and exciting for our students. So here is an example of the introduction of one of the story time books. And bear with me because the video may be a bit delayed. Let's see. So see, I said the name of our book is Polar Bear, Polar Bear, What Do You Hear? And I pointed to the title of the book. And then I also gestured to one of the core vocabulary words that was targeted for this particular story. What do you hear? And our book is written by Phil Martin Jr. And it's illustrated by Eric Carl. And an illustrator is someone who draws pictures. So Eric Carl drew all the pictures of the animals in this book. So see, there I pointed to the author, I said who wrote the book, and then I explained what an illustrator was and, and explained what he did for that story. Okay, and this is the front of our book. Polar bear, polar bear. Oops. So front was one of the vocabulary words for this story. And so again, I held up the core word to show that's the word and what it pertained to. And in this video, um, this while well, yes, the story times we run are usually in our EIBI classroom. This was done during a virtual story time during the COVID-19 pandemic. So I was really taking the vocabulary words off the, the background to show the words so the listeners could see the vocabulary words through Zoom. Oops. All right, now after the story. So the clinician will review who was in the story, utilizing the who poster, and visual representations of characters from the book may be used to place on the posters. And again, we would want to use a most to least prompting procedure to tap to the characters of the book. 
and we would review the poster by saying, let's review who was in our book. And the clinicians will also review what happened in the story. Similarly to the who poster, students will be provided with visual representations of three things that happened in the story sequence. And then students will be prompted again using a most to least prompting procedure to place them in the correct order. So students will attach the pictures to the poster and then, and then the clinician may state, let's review what happened in the story. And using temporal sequencing, learners will state first, this happened, then this happened, last, this happened. And so here, very poor photo, but you'll see uh, laminated pictures of the characters in the story and the students putting the characters on our story map. So saying, you know, this is who was in our book and, and, and placing the characters on the poster. Oops. I'm sorry. So there you see I'm using some of the laminated character pictures to, uh, or sorry, some of the laminated character pictures included throughout the actual story reading to enrich the story. And then after this, the, the pictures can be used on the story map. So our goal is for these vocabulary words to be generalized across environments. And we must remember that language and literacy are not compartmentalized skills. We can't just use these words in one set activity. So we can't use them just in story time. We wanna practice them through multiple activities throughout the day. So here you see a picture of kids in a garden. You see a picture of kids playing with a dollhouse. You see a child playing with his dad. We want to generalize these words across environments. And again, children demonstrate better learning and generalization of core vocabulary when it's used across activities. And here is an example, again, this was during our virtual story time via Zoom, of an extension activity of the core words during a brief video clip. And see, I gesture to the core word I, saying, I see a rhino. Again, gesturing to the core word what, one of the targeted core words that was in that particular story. again gesturing to another core word so you get the idea and this again can be can be used across you know additional activities as well and lastly we want to teach to independence so this means fading supports using errorless teaching with the goal for the client to use core words independently in the context of story time and eventually across environments through extension activities and other activities as well and here are some references. And of course, please feel free to contact me. Click, um, and here's my email address, claire.seafried at ellsforautism.org. I'm happy to answer any questions. And that's all. I want to give a big thank you to Tara Murray, one of our behavior therapists who really helped provide a lot of the behavior analytic teaching strategies that were discussed during this presentation.